Oh, is it looking up on the screen? It should. I should get a notification on the screen. Okay. Right. We're recording. All right. Thank you all for uh, coming to the Friday Night Bible Study. We're starting the series on the sanctuary truth. If you caught the sermon last week, you know there's a total of 14, uh, 14 topics. So, uh it, it's going to take us a while to get through it. We're going to be taking off the holiday weekends because Thanksgiving weekend, Christmas weekend, and New Year's weekend because you all have lives and so do I. <laughs> so Amen. so uh, we won't have anything going on those three, so don't feel like you might miss anything. I don't want anyone to miss anything. But before we begin, let's start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together virtually to study your word and to dive into this uh, doctrine on the sanctuary and the truths you have for us in your word. We ask, Lord, you send your spirit to be with us, guide us, and give us, uh, lead us to truth and give us understanding. We thank you for asking these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, here we go. So, Secrets of the Sanctuaries, the general theme of the whole series, tonight's topic is the Heavenly Sanctuary. Now, we're going to kind of take an overview of the Heavenly Sanctuary. The details of what's going on in the Heavenly Sanctuary right now is a later study. We might touch on it a little bit, but that's, that's for a whole different study. So, we won't get too much into that. This is going to be basically an overview and what can we learn uh, from the general themes of the heavenly sanctuary and start off with the text and hopefully this will be the only one i have to read tonight with all the people we have here to help uh, hebrews 8 5 here it says who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as moses was divinely instructed in him as moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. All right. And so that, of course, was uh, when they were in the desert and God took them up on the mountain for a period of time, which we'll get into here in the, a little bit in the study. And he laid out to him all the instructions uh, for uh, making the sanctuary. So we know that the earthly sanctuary was patterned after the heavenly sanctuary. All right, so let's start off. You know, where does God live? Does God have a home? Right, we know he's omnipresent, which means yeah. what? Everywhere. He's, he's everywhere. everywhere. He's everywhere, right? Yeah. So can a being that is everywhere simultaneously have a home? But well, we're going to get into that. Um, Normally, when we do this, I would just go down the line and hand out text. There's too many of us here for me to see everybody to make sure I don't skip anyone. So I'll, I'll be asking for volunteers. Uh, first text we have is found in 1 Kings chapter 8, and there's three verses we're going to read there. Uh, do I have a volunteer for that? I'll do Perfect. it. Okay, Nora's got 1 Kings 8, and then the second one we're going to look at is Psalms 102, verse 19. I've got that. You got that? All right. Yep. Um, all right, go ahead, Nora. 1 Kings chapter 8. Chapter what, 8. What verse? Verse 30. Oh, the whole 8. Oh, no, not the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> 30, verse 30, okay. then verse 43, and then say, verse 49. Like, that's a lot. Yeah. 43 and 49, Okay. First Kings, verse 8, and I'll start with 30. Okay, and may you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. And then 43, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. 
and 49, then here in heaven, your dwelling place, their prayer and their supplication and maintain their call. Mm -hmm. Right. So from those three verses, what was the one consistent theme? Heaven. He lives in heaven. Dwelling right, his dwelling in place heaven. is in heaven. All right. So God is, you could say he's, he has a general presence that's everywhere all at once, but he has a special presence in heaven. Now, why would he need to be, have a place where he could have a special presence? That way he may hear our supplications. Okay. Now he could hear from anywhere, assume. Just, well, yeah, just I think it's probably because that, he's got to have a place that like the angels and everybody else can actually go <laughs> see him. Okay. Like you, see, right. like you hear about another text. It's like they went to go worship him. They were at him. So he's got Absolutely. a place he's actually at. Okay, so he is present everywhere, but we are not, and the angels are not. So uh, if he wants to have a place where they can all together, gather together, you know, and worship him and uh, other things as a group, then it needs to be some place where he can have a special presence, if you will. So now let's look at Psalms 102.19. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth. All right. So now here it gets a little bit more specific. It says not only does his dwelling place in heaven, but it says, where, where is he looking down from? Sanctuary. His sanctuary. 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 Yes. His sanctuary. So this is mm -hmm. his sanctuary, which is where? In, in heaven. heaven. In heaven. And from there, we know that he can hear us. And it says he looks down, he can see us, right? So he keeps tabs uh, from his sanctuary. And I think I just answered the question here. I just apologize for that. Is there, <laughs> so what do these texts teach us about the place where God dwells? It's in heaven. It's, it's in sanctuary. heaven. It's sanctuary, it's sanctuary in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll try Amen. Not, I'll try not to answer the questions going forward. <laughs> That's a bad habit. I'm sorry. All right. So now, how are we to understand what this means? What does this mean to us? That he is at heaven, interceding for us. Okay. So, yeah, we know that Jesus went back to heaven uh, prepare to prepare a place for us. We know that he's doing an uh -huh. intercessory work now. That's actually going to be a later study. But uh, what else? <laughs> I think that uh, it shows that there were two distinct sanctuaries, the one on heaven and then the replica on earth. All right. So two distinct sanctuaries. There's definitely a sanctuary in heaven. Heaven is a real place mm -hmm. where God has a, re a real sanctuary, mm -hmm. uh, and that's his dwelling place. All right. So very good. So we know that when we're that verse we read from Hebrews 8, 5 earlier, where it's talking about Moses making the uh, tabernacle after a pattern that was revealed to him. That pattern is based on the heavenly sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And now I think we talked about this already. If God is present everywhere, how, how can he dwell in heaven? Or let's think about why would he dwell in heaven? Well, I think it's like what we said, so there can be a gathering place for everybody else to be and to worship him. Yeah, because heaven is kind of like the hub of the universe, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. It's the center. It's where Central command. Central command, right? It's his seat of government, which we'll there get into go. that a little bit more here later on in this study. So if you think of heaven as the seat of his government, then it makes sense that he would dwell there. I mean, to, I don't really like comparing our national leaders to God. But if you think about it, where do most of our national leaders reside? Washington. Washington. Right, at the Capitol, which makes sense because that's, that's where their work is. So it kind of helps to think a little bit that way. All right. Well, we, way, also was... read in, mm -hmm. no, we also read in Isaiah where every new moon, every Sabbath, we will all gather together. To worship God. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep and so, he, go ahead. 
Yeah, so that's the in the, the New Jerusalem and the Earth Made New. Yeah, we're all going right. to be gathering together there. And uh, I believe we get into that a little bit in, in a later topic as well. All right, those are all good answers. For those of you uh, who I didn't welcome initially, joined us while we we're in progress, welcome. Uh, it's good to see you all on here. Thank you. You are Thanks. welcome. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right. Hello. 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 Hi, we got the video. Okay. Yeah. Well, we oh, there you are. Here. I see you. Hi. All right. Welcome to the study. Glad you could oh, all make you. it. We have a good yeah, group we... tonight. You know, normally I sign yeah. the verses out, but there's so many people here that I can't see you all at once on my screen. So we're just asking for volunteers as we go. So okay. on this next set, uh, I have these two texts that are in John, John 4, 24, and then 14, 1 through 3. Do I have someone that would like to read those texts out of John? Yes, me. Okay, Adiel's got those. Uh, who's got 1 Kings 8, 27? I'll do it. Is that Jerry? Who will say, say I do it? I think Jerry said 1 Kings 8, okay, that, Jerry. Hebrews. Hebrew, Hebrew. Hebrew. Me. Hebrews 8. Okay, Lydia's got Hebrews 8, verse 2, and then the last one is Acts 7, verses 55 and 56. I got it. Nicole's got that. All right. Adiel, Adiel if you will, First John 4, 24. You, you got the, oh. the, the Ram Bible. Oh, uh, yeah. I is it can... First John or John? John. Uh, I thought John. It was... John. Yeah, I thought it was John. Yeah, it's the gospel. Okay. The Gospel, John. The Gospel of John. Okay, that's what I thought. The Gospel of John. All right. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that, Nora. Okay, so let's see. 424. Uh, here it is. Welcome. Here it is. Oh, yes. And um, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. All right, so... What does that text tell us about God? He's spirit. He's spirit. He's spirit. Okay. He's not physical. Right. He's, he's not material. He's, he's not confined to a, a physical body like we are. Right. So, now we're we know he's God. He can do anything. He can manifest himself in that form if he wants to. But he's a spirit. Mm -hmm. And then um, chapter fourteen, verses one through three. Yes. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, or many rooms, it's in this version. If uh, it were not so, um, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Oh, no, well, that was verse four. <laughs> yeah, you stop right there. All right, so, <laughs> so what does this text tell us about where God lives? Now, we know that he's in heaven. We know that there's a sanctuary in heaven. What is this else does this tell us about heaven? There's mansions. Many mansions. Yeah, mansions, many, many rooms, mansions, buildings. Many rooms. It says many, right? Yeah, many. many. All right, so when you picture that, you know, are, are you picturing just some strange kind of spiritual place where I have a little nook that he's going to shove us into, or are these actual buildings? These are actual physical buildings. buildings. Actual buildings. Physical buildings. buildings. Physical buildings. buildings. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let, let's keep in mind that when uh, Jesus returned to heaven, he returned in a physical body. Amen. Which mm -hmm. he is, is going to maintain that physical body throughout all eternity. So you can imagine that that's, he's going to a place where there are physical buildings. So heaven is not just a, a place out in the cosmos where God has a sanctuary. It's, this is a complete city. Amen. Right now, uh, 1 Kings eight twenty seven. Yes. <clears throat> but God, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I have built it. All right. So now think about that for a minute. So we know that God dwells in heaven, but does heaven contain God? 
No. 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 Because he's no. everywhere. All at once. Now, what does that mean to you that God cannot be contained in a building, a structure, or even in heaven itself? It means that he's uh, immaterial. He's not physical. It means that, like you said, he is everywhere. He is omnipresent. So it's, he's big, right? He, he's bigger. Yeah, he's big. Yeah. He's bigger than anything that you can imagine. I know we like to watch yeah. uh, Veggie Tales, and they have some, you know, God. Uh -huh. Y'all heard that? Uh -huh. Well, he's bigger, definitely. He's singing that the rest of the yeah, I, I, it's running through my head already. It's got me going. So God is bigger than anything you can think of. So that should also kind of inspire you as to just the sheer power uh, and uh, the magnitude of God. Uh, Hebrews 8, 2. Uh -huh. It says in here, a minister of the sanctuary and in of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitch and not men. So here, of course, in Hebrews, a lot of what we get in there is about Jesus' ministry in heaven. And it says mm -hmm. here, he went to a tabernacle that the Lord pitched, right? So who built the tabernacle in heaven? The Lord. Jesus. Yeah. Right? Well, God, Jesus, they all, Jesus. Uh, the Trinity probably worked together on it. But we know that, uh, and it's called the true tabernacle, right? So everything we see on earth is a copy of that true tabernacle in heaven. Amen. In Acts 7, 55 and 56. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So we know that God dwells in heaven. heaven. We know that heaven. He, specifically it's in his heavenly sanctuary. Jesus went to heaven. And where does this text say Jesus is? The right hand of God. So God he's in where? Stand. He's in heaven. He's in heaven. He's at the right hand of God. God is in heaven in the sanctuary in his temple. So where is Jesus? In the sanctuary. Right. If he's in at God's sanctuary. right hand, then he's there in the temple with him. So that uh, kind of gives us a, a bigger picture of the sanctuary and of heaven. Now there's more to go here. The Bible says that this dwelling place is real. How can we learn to trust in all that the Bible teaches us, no matter how hard it is to sometimes understand? See, a lot of people have an image in their mind when they talk, think about heaven. They think about little naked babies floating <laughs> on clouds, playing harps, which doesn't sound like a real physical place. But Bible, the Bible is very clear that it's a real place, physical buildings. We know that the angels are real beings um, who, they're, they're, of course, more, I don't want to say spirit, but, you know, they, they can travel around. They're not restricted to some of the limitations that we are, but they still have physical bodies. Uh, so it's a real place. So how can we learn to trust what the Bible teaches us? even when it's hard for us to understand. By faith? So, you know, sometimes we just have to take it by faith. Yeah, take it, take it on faith. Yes. Remember yeah. what we read earlier about God. God is bigger than, he's bigger than the boogeyman, <laughs> definitely, right? Sorry. <laughs> he's bigger than heaven. He's bigger than the earth. He's bigger than anything that we can comprehend, right? So just acknowledging that he himself is beyond our comprehension should enable us to accept the fact that he can do things we can't understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that we're going to have all eternity getting to know God better and better, but yet we will never completely understand all there is to know about God, simply because he's an infinite God and we're finite beings. So that was a good answer, definitely. Now let's go into a little bit more detail. We know that uh he's in his heavenly sanctuary we know that uh one of the texts we mentioned here pictured god on the throne so let's talk about the throne room what do these texts most most of these are in psalms what do these have to tell us about the throne room 
So we have five texts here. We got the first one, Psalms 47, verses 6 through 9. Who would like to read that? I got that one. You got that one? Okay. And then Psalms 93, 1 and 2. I'll take it. Gary's got it. All right. Psalms 103, verse 19. I got it. Got it. All right. Revelation 4, 2 and 3. I got it. And the last one, Job 1, 6. I'll take it. Okay, that's all of them. So let's start. Psalms 47, 6 through 9. Singing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, kings, or sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have gathered together. The people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Right. So what does that tell us about God and his throne? Well, God is the king. God's a king. So it's a, a kingly throne. And he rules over what from that throne? Is it just heaven? It's a, over the nations. Over, over the nations. nations. The shields of the earth, which sounds like the... Shields make me think of like armies. Yes, stuff. shields make you think of the armies. Princes, yeah. king, basically he rules over everything. Rules over everything. He's in charge of all the nations, all the armies. Everything on this earth everything. is is under his control. Amen. Amen. Psalms 93, 1 and 2. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he have girded himself. The world also established that it cannot be moved. All right. So Thy what throne is, is established of all thou art from everlasting. Oh, okay. His kingdom. I thought there was a little bit more there. All right. So what does that tell us about God and his throne? How was God clothed? With strength. Strength. And with majesty. majesty. Strength and majesty. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what did it say about his throne? It was established from of old. From old. Exactly. It's, it's been there a while. It's from, from everlasting. everlasting. From everlasting. So he's always been, right? Amen. He has an eternal throne. And it said also that he cannot be moved, right? Right. So yeah. no one, no one's going to be able to dethrone him. Right, his throne is an everlasting throne, and it will always be an everlasting throne. So God is in command, always has been, always will be. All right, so that's something dependable, uh, and Lord knows we need something dependable, and that's that's something that we can all count on. Psalms one hundred three nineteen. The Lord hath prepared His throne in the heavens, and His kingdom ruleth over all. All right, so if we were not quite sure before, who all does he rule over? All. Everything. All. All right, is that limited to earth? No. No, no all is all, <laughs> right? If you can vision it, if it's a place you can go, if there's people there, he rules there. No matter where you go in this universe, that's a place God rules. So that's, I find that comforting. Revelation yeah. 4, 2 and 3. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in, in appearance like an emerald. Okay, here it's kind of giving us a visual description. John is uh, describing what he sees in a vision using the... I guess the, the most descriptive things he could think of, um, I mean, can you imagine trying to describe, you know, God's eternal throne with the infinite God sitting on it? Probably be a little hard to come by. But when you hear that description, what comes to mind? Light. Light. Colors. Right. God of light. Lots of colors. Green, what else? Green colors, yeah. What was around the throne? 
A rainbow. 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 Uh -huh. okay. What does that remind you of? The promise to. The promise. The covenant. Exactly. The covenant. Mm -hmm. All right. So he's a, he's a God of light. Uh, he's a God of promises. Promise. Uh, he's. Uh, well, I, I think too also of uh, riches because you're talking yeah. about all the emeralds. So he's he's riches beyond measure, right? He's he's a God of promises. You know, you can trust his promises. He's a God of light. There is no darkness in him. So those are all very positive things that you could help to reflect on when you're thinking about God's nature. And the last one we have here, Job one six. Job 1 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and, the, and Satan also came among them. Okay. Now I put this text in here for, for a reason. We, we talked about why would God need, you know, if he can be everywhere at once, why would he need a place where he can be especially present? And we think about it who are all these sons of God? It's the rulers of different worlds. The rulers of different worlds. Oh, and they're coming the to world. They're coming to heaven because it's the capital. They're coming together for a meeting that evidently God's presiding over. Now why was Satan there? If he was the ruler of earth. He was a ruler. When Adam uh, sinned, yep. he, he uh -huh. surrendered his right to rule earth to Satan. So that's why Satan was present there. Now Jesus took back that rulership, so Satan's Satan's not not able to claim that. Either. Amen. Amen. But uh, that, that also shows that 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 uh, heaven's a, an actual physical place because he's got to have a place to kick him out of. True. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if he just kicked him out of a, a bunch of clouds, well, that was Satan's like, okay, I'll go over there to those clouds. You know, that's not a yeah. big deal. <laughs> So it's an actual physical place he had to be kicked out of, and it has to be an actual physical place so all of these representatives from the different worlds can come together so they can have their, their meeting. Now, I have no idea how often they do that kind of thing. Uh, I imagine that God being who he's been revealed to be uh, in the Bible would probably have regularly scheduled, you know, like we have our, our weekly Sabbaths, and it says, you know, from... A Sabbath to Sabbath, new moon to new moon. We're all going to be getting together in heaven. So it's probably something similar to that. Uh, well, I imagine we'll find out one day. Mm -hmm. Amen. So now what is the importance of the fact that God's throne, not just his temple, but his actual throne is established in heaven? I think of throne, if you think about like an earthly throne, that's usually where your seat of government is. Okay. So it's where the seat of government is. What else? Because it is holy, I think. It's holy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We know that uh, we know that God is in his temple in heaven, in his sanctuary. We know that God is on his throne. So we can assume at this point that his throne is in the temple. We'll get into that later. Mm -hmm. But uh, anything else? Okay. And the fact, when you think about a throne, you think about a king that's over all over a kingdom. God's throne; He's over all the universe. Over all the universe, right? We already talked about heaven being the hub, if you will, the center. I don't know if it's the geographical center. I mean, it would make sense if it was. <laughs> certainly, as far as the government goes, it's the center of the universe. And if that's where God's throne is, then that's kind of a symbol. That God is ruler over the whole universe. So those are all good answers. God's throne is established in heaven has several ramifications. One of them is that God is both independent and superior to the rest of the universe. Amen. Not, not only is uh -huh. he ruler over all the universe, he's not dependent on anybody, mm -hmm. any power, any world. He is above that. He's superior to all of that. Which makes sense since he created that. You would expect the creator to be superior to his creation. Mm -hmm. All right. We got two more texts. 
going back to Psalms again, Psalms had a lot to say about God's <laughs> throne. Uh, well, it makes sense since a, a large part of Psalms was written by a king. You would imagine he would have a lot to say about thrones. Uh, Psalms 89, 14, who would like to read? I got it. You got it? All right. And then Psalms 97, 2? I got it. Adiel. All right. Adiel, all right. And that was Doug on the first one, right? Yeah. All right, perfect. Yeah, I apologize. I can't, I can't see everyone's faces, so I'm assuming that. Well, that's not much better. Okay, let me go back to the other one. <laughs> all right. Go ahead, Psalms 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. All right. So what was it said the foundation of his throne? Righteous, yes. Righteous the righteousness and justice. justice is the foundation. And then what were the other two attributes we heard? Mercy and truth. Mercy and truth. truth. Mm -hmm. All right. So those things all go hand in hand, right? All right. Let's look at uh, Psalms 97. Well, my version. Wait, go uh, ahead. My version reads justice and judgment are the yes. application of that throne. Justice and judgment. Okay. So those are all good attributes. Now we're getting here into the attributes of God and his throne. And if it's an attribute of his throne, then that means it's an attribute of his rulership. So you, you can extend that this is the way his government is run. Wouldn't it be nice if our government was run that way? That's not even. <laughs> but now let's go to the next verse, Psalms 97 2. Okay. Clouds and thick darkness surround him righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne okay. all right so it gets here again righteousness and justice is the foundation so his mm -hmm. his throne is built upon those principles his his kingdom is built on that it's not it's not uh, corrupt it's like, not corrupt like <laughs> the place that we are living now <laughs> well yeah that's a that's a problem when you're in a fallen world and <laughs> fallen men uh, run things, you're gonna, you're gonna run into that. So God's rule encompasses righteousness and justice, as well as love and truthfulness. Mm -hmm. These moral qualities describe how he acts in the human world, that's how he interacts with us, and underscore his position in the entire universe. So he, that's the way he is with everyone. So these- Amen. These qualities which compose his rule are the same as those that he wants his people to manifest in their lives. And it is our sacred privilege to do so. Now think about that. We talked here. It said righteousness, justice, love, and truthfulness. That's his qualities. And those are the qualities he wants us to exemplify. That's a tall order. <laughs> right? How do we do that? Um, only through him. Only through him. That is great. We'll, we'll get a little bit more insight on that here in just a little bit. Now, in what manner does God desire for his subjects to live? We're going to go a little bit deeper on this. Micah 6, 8. Uh, who's got that? I got it. Okay, Nicole's got that. I actually preached a, a sermon on that, on that verse once. And then Isaiah 59, 12 to 15. I got it. Okay. And that was, is that Nora? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I say a 59, 12 to 15. Right. That's correct. We're having Nicole read Micah 6, 8 first. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Now, interesting thing about, about this text uh, when you're reading the uh, Jewish or Hebrew literature, they go from effect to cause. So they start with what the effects were and they work their way to what the cause was, right? So if you read that backwards, it says, you start, where is it here? Okay. All right, so it says, the last thing it says, walk humbly with your God. So the cause is walking humbly with God. If you walk humbly with God, then you will love mercy. Well, if you love mercy, then you're going to do justly. Mm -hmm. 
requires of you. And that's what the <laughs> Lord requires of us. But it all begins with walking humbly with your God. So you've got to humble yourself. You have to walk with God. And then those other things will be the natural product of that. So it's what you said earlier. The only way we can live the life he wants is if we start off by humbling ourselves and walking with him. Uh, Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, 12 to 15. For our transgressions are multiplied before you. And our sins testify against us. As for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street and an, an equity cannot enter. So truth fails and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. All right, now what do we get out of those verses? This is kind of like showing what happens That's when you this don't, is, uh, right? This is, this is the opposite, right? So mm -hmm. if you don't humble yourself, right, to, to walk with God so that you can love mercy and then do justly, this is what happens. Right? So if, if you don't live the way God wants you to live, you're going to end up falling into this situation. Does it sound like a good place to be? No. 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 Mm -mm. no. So for those people who resist God's rule, turn their back on it, and try to go their own way, that's where they end up. Not a good place to be. Right. Turn on a TV and you'll see that place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So I, I, I try not to do that. Yeah. Most, most of the time when my TV is on, it's on YouTube and I'm watching like Amazing Facts or I have some music playing or something like that. Uh -huh. um, but now this brings us to the next question, right? Given those two scenarios we just read, how can we better manifest goodness, righteousness, and justice, the things that God wants us to emulate in a world that's filled with evil, unrighteousness, and injustice, as, we, as we've seen? Can you keep our focus on God? Okay, keep our focus on God. All right. You gotta so ask for it. help. Ask for help. for help. Right. God, he's promised, right, that if we ask, you know, yeah, he'll, he'll give it. Yeah, we'll receive. Yeah. <coughs> All right, what else? You can follow the guidelines Obey given you know, in the, in okay, the follow, commandments as well as the two great commandments. Okay, follow the guidelines that he's given us. We have the, the ten Now, just think about the Ten Commandments. I know we've talked about this many times. Broken up into two groups, the first four. Talk about our relationship to God. If we follow those four, we'll have a good relationship with God. The last six are our relationship with our fellow men. And if we follow those, then we would have a good relationship with our fellow man. I mean, if, if everyone were following those rules, there'd be no stealing. Uh, there'd be no murder or violence of any kind, really. Uh, there'd be no um, covetousness, right? You wouldn't be trying to outdo your neighbors. Um Let's see, you wouldn't be lying, right? You'd be respectful to your parents. Uh, all of us parents on here would love to see that. Uh, we get that pretty much from our kids, so yeah. uh, I, I appreciate that. But how much better would the world be if everybody followed those guidelines? So it's very good. And of course, in order to follow those guidelines, you have to be familiar with them. And we get that by studying, right? studying the Bible, reading his word, and uh, making ourselves familiar with that. That's part of the purpose of doing these uh, studies. Now, I know this says read Revelation 4 and 5. We're not going to read <laughs> Revelation 4 and 5. So like, for, that, for those of you who saw that on the screen, don't panic. <laughs> We're not actually going to read through that. We're going to go through and hit some highlights, though. Because this talks, this tells us a little bit about the heavenly dwelling place of God. 
And of course, this is the scene you remember we have uh, yeah, where, where John is first taken in vision into the throne room and then you have the lamb uh, receives the scroll from the father. But we already read the part where he describes the throne. Okay. And but then uh, if you go in verse five, now verse five says, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. And we know that lightnings, thunderings, and voices together uh, is an indication of the presence of God. And it says, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne. Now, if you think about the seven lamps, where, where else do we see seven lamps in the Bible? In the sanctuary. In the sanctuary. In the sanctuary. Now, I know this is the first study. We haven't gotten into the furniture yet. But this is sanctuary symbolism being used here. And he said, before the throne, which were the seven spirits of God. It says, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. Now, now think about that. The throne, God's throne room, he has before it a sea of glass. So evidently, it's, it's a really smooth, shiny floor that almost looks like glass. I'm sure it's not actually glass. But uh, if it's big enough for John to look at this and think of it as a sea, how big is that throne room? That's pretty big. <laughs> it's got to be huge. Big. Yeah. Got to be huge. But we see later scenes where it talks about thousands upon thousands of people standing before the throne. Uh, so it's, it's got to be uh, enormous. And then it talks about the living creatures, the four living creatures that were around the throne. Uh, and if you go through, it says the first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And if you read those uh, descriptions, remember how the sanctuary was in ancient Israel. Well, in when they were traveling through the wilderness, they camped around it on four sides, and they had the. It talks about the banners of. Uh, yeah. the different tribes and these creatures it's describing here are the four tribes that were closest to the sanctuary mm -hmm. in the desert so again this sanctuary imagery it's God's people being around around the temple which here it's around his throne then it also has uh, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. Right? So that's also imagery that's coming from the priesthood. Serve God. They, they were divided up into 24 uh, groups, if you will. And then you have, of course, in uh, chapter 5, when Jesus comes onto the scene, how does it describe him? When it says, um, here in verse 6. A lamb like he, he was yeah. slain. A lamb as it, though it had been slain. And as we know here it's it talking taken. about Jesus. So that is, again, that's imagery that's coming from the services in the sanctuary. Right? And then, let's see. Verse 11 says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. The living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Essentially, there's a whole mess of them, right? <laughs> it's a bunch. We don't know how many. It's a lot. Wow. <laughs> I'm asking to tell you that's a lot. So they're all gathered around the throne. So this throne room, which is a real place, is huge. Like we decided, it's the seat of his power. This is where all the created beings come together to worship him and to acknowledge him. And you notice, they say, blessing and honor. This is verse 13 I'm reading. It says, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Ever and ever. Amen. And ever. All right. So there's, there's a lot in there. We do. Uh, we did the Revelation study. Of course, we took these two chapters uh, in detail, verse by verse. If you really want to get into it, that's available. Uh, those videos are available on Facebook, and uh, we may, well, not may, definitely, some point in the future, we'll redo that Revelation study again. Um, but for now, 
if you need more details, that's there. All right, so in what way is the plan of salvation revealed in each text? Well, if you read through it, right, it says that, you know, God was there. He was righteous. He provided the lamb, right, that died for our, for our sins. He's going to be reigning eternally. So that tells you there that he has redeemed us and he's going to rule over us and then and bring us all back to him. So that's, it's kind of a huge overview of the plan of salvation. There's a lot more detail, but it's all tied to the sanctuary imagery you see sanctuary. in those two, those two uh, chapters. If you read through Revelation, the sanctuary is all through that book. It, it's everywhere you go, go, it's there. But the specifics we saw, I have the highlights here. The vision of the heavenly throne room is a vision of the heavenly sanctuary. So they're one and the same. Their words for door and trumpet, oh, I, I left out the trumpets. The, the words for door and trumpet used here uh, appear often in the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament in reference to the sanctuary. It's the same words. The three precious stones in Revelation 4.3 are part of the high priest's breastplate. So when it's talking about the description of the throne, remember the gems? Those, those three stones appear in the, the breastplate of the high priest. The seven lampstands are reminiscent of the lampstands in Solomon's temple. And uh, even in the uh, temple in the desert, the lampstand had seven lamps. The 24 elders remind us of the 24 divisions of service for the temple priest throughout the year. So they had them divided, uh, divided out, uh, and that's all in Leviticus. You can get into that. The slain lamb of Revelation 5 points to Christ's sacrificial death. Christ the lamb is the only mediator of divine salvation and is accounted worthy because of his triumph, his sacrifice, and his divinity. So when they're praising the lamb, and I know we didn't read through all that. They mention these things. This is why he's worthy to receive the scroll. It's because of these things. So now think about what it means that Christ, as God himself, took on our humanity and died as our substitute. Now, why should this truth motivate everything that you do? Why, why should this motivate you? Well, one thing, look at what he left behind once it, when it describes, you know, his throne, God, what he left behind, that he came down down here and took on humanity um, and humbled himself. I mean, that that's pretty amazing right there. That is pretty amazing. He humbled himself. I mean, he left all of that. Come down, and it's not like he came down here to say, well, I'm going to humble myself and be an earthly ruler, which would have still been quite a step down. But he went all the way down to the son of a carpenter, born in a stable, right? So, or, and actually laid in a feeding trough um, and spent, you know, his, his early years as baby on the, on the lamb, if you will, on the run, should you yeah. say on the lamb, for, uh, for his very life because Herod was trying to kill him. Um, so yeah, he came a long ways down and then we go back to what we read in Micah. So he humbled himself and came down here and died for our sins. He showed us the way to live. He gave us a revelation of what the father's like. And then he asked us to humble ourselves enough to walk with him. He says, just, just follow me. Just, you know, read my word, trust me and everything will work out. So I, I think if he can humble himself that far, you know, how hard should it be for me to humble myself? It shouldn't be that hard, right? Mm -hmm. He's definitely set the example. He came a long ways. I don't have to go far at all. Now, now what else does God do in his heavenly temple? So he does more than sit up there and listen to uh, our prayers and watch over us to see what we're doing to record what's going on. Uh, and just have people come and worship him. There's more going on. So let's go. We've got uh, Psalms 11, 4 to 7. Who would like that? Psalms 11, 4 to 
Psalms 11, verses 4 through 7. Do I have a volunteer? Get it. You got it? Yeah, I get it. Right. Yeah. Deuteronomy 25.1. I can do it. Got that one. Psalms 9, verses 4 through 8. I'll do it. All right. And the last one's Habakkuk, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, because I just like going to some of those little, mm -hmm. little Bible texts. I got that one. <laughs> okay. Nicole's got that one. I figured I'd look up the hard one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like to work in those little used books because there's a lot of good stuff in it. Psalms 11, verse 4 through 7. <laughs> All right. Uh, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked, he will rain coals. Fire and brimstone and burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. So what is God doing in his heavenly temple in that verse? What is he actually doing? He's testing people. Yeah. He's testing people, right? And it says there mm -hmm. that he upholds the righteous, but yet he says he's going to send fiery destruction on the unrighteous, right? So there's testing and there's some judgment going on. Okay. All right, so Deuteronomy 25, 1. If there be a controversy between men and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. So he's talking here about judgment, judgment right? <laughs> like every other word. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's, it's used a lot in there. Justifying the righteous, right, and condemning the wicked. Psalms 9, 4 to 8. Psalms 9, 4 to 8. For you have maintained my right and my cause. You sat on the throne judging in righteousness. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. O enemy, destructions are finished forever. And you have destroyed cities even their memory has perished. Um, until nine? You know, just through nine? eight. Just through eight. Oh, through eight. Yeah. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness, and he shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. So, again, judgment is a prevalent scene here. So, we know in his throne room we're, we're getting to feel kind of like a courtroom here right where, mm -hmm, God, yeah. where god is not only is he the king right and not only did he provide for our salvation jesus is there as a priest but now we have a judge on mm -hmm. his bench uh, let's see habakkuk 2 verses 1 through 5 i will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me, and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed, for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Indeed, because he transgresses, transgresses by wine, he is a proud man. He, did, he does not stay at home. Because he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all nations, and he eats up for himself all peoples. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, there's some strong judgment going on there, but notice it said on there that his judgment shall surely come. Right? It's, it, he will not tarry. So we know it's definitely coming. But it says, talking about the wicked man here, it says the wicked man seems to be content in, or trusting in the fact that nothing bad has happened to him yet. So he just keeps on ignoring the oncoming judgment. Right? So it's kind of a warning there to us that 
don't be fooled just because it hasn't happened yet that it's not going to. It said it will surely come. So we know that God has a time and a place designated uh, for each and every one of us. He knows when it's going to be, and it will come at his designated time. So don't, don't fall into that trap. When God judges, the throne room becomes a courtroom and the throne a judgment seat. So that's all going on. So the, there's a lot going on here in the heavenly temple. You have the temple itself, which is a place of worship. It's also a place where God rules. It's his throne. And now here it's a place where judgment is taking place, all in this one building. And all of this is... Uh, symbolized through the sanctuary and the services that we're going to be studying. Now, divine judgment involves both the wicked and the righteous, so there's judgment for both. And it's important you understand is there's a difference, right? What judgment does each group receive? What happens to the wicked? They're destroyed. They're destroyed. They're destroyed. Uh -huh. right? What happens to the righteous? We go to heaven. We go to heaven. He'd go to heaven. He says he's going to uphold the righteous, right? <laughs> right. He's going to lift them up. He's going to bring them home. We already said, Jesus said, you know, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there, you may be also. So that's what happens to the righteous. Two different things, but both groups are being judged. Right. So why is this important for us to know? And why must we trust? In God's judgment. I mean, think about it. Who would you who would you want to determine the fate of all the people on the earth? God. Is there anyone you would trust other than God? No. 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 See, God knows all things. He sees all things. Right? We we fall into the trap of judging people on a daily basis. Everyone does it. It's human nature. It's hard not to. You have to make judgments about people when you're interacting with them. And it's not always like this is a good person. This is a bad person. A lot of times it's how is this person going to respond? You know, that's a judgment. You know, you would, a lot of times uh, when we talk about Bible studies and why people are afraid to give Bible studies, it's because they're assuming that person's going to reject them. Right. So they're making a judgment that that person's not interested. That's a judgment. Um, so, you know, that's, it's just human nature. We can't really help it. We can't trust ourselves because we don't know all the facts. We don't know what's in a person's heart. God does. Now, what is Christ doing at the throne of God right now? So this is, we're just touching on this tonight. We're not going to do an in-depth study, but we mentioned earlier, Hebrews has a lot to say about Christ's ministry in heaven. So we're going to touch on it tonight since we're talking about the heavenly sanctuary and that's where he is right now. Let's start with Hebrews 2.17. Yeah, so who, I'm sorry, who was that? Oh, oh he, Hebrews 2.17, do I have a volunteer? Let me see. Sure, I'll do it. Gary's oh. got it. Hebrews okay. 8, 1 and 2. I'll do it. Okay, and then Hebrews 9.24. Aye. Okay. I think we got everybody. Start Hebrews 2.17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So here it's talking about Jesus serving as a high priest. And what was the purpose? To reconcile us to God. Reconcile, reconcile us to God. He's the perfect mediator because he's both God and man. He knows both sides intimately. So he can bring us together like nobody else could. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Now this is the main of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. 
a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Right. So he's serving as a minister in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. The true sanctuary. So if you think of what the priests were doing on earth, right, he kind of has those duties in heaven. Now, of course, he's not having to do sacrifices because there's no sinners in heaven. Right, he's already done oh, the so ultimate sacrifice. sacrifice. <laughs> but what he's doing now is what the priest did in the inner compartments, right? The 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 holy place and the most holy place. Mm -hmm. That's what he's doing right now. Okay, and then Hebrews nine twenty four. It says, "For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands." which are copies of the true things, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God in our behalf. He entered into the heaven itself to appear now before God in our behalf. So that's pretty plain, right? He's appeared before God so in the holy places. So it's talking about mm -hmm. the inside of the temple, right? The holy mm -hmm. place, most holy place. And if you think about what was in there, I know we haven't gotten into the furniture yet, mm -hmm. but they had the altar of incense, which was the prayers that came up before God. So he's in there presenting uh, all of that on our behalf to God. So mm -hmm. he's representing us before the Father. Amen. So, and that I couldn't think of a better representative there. Mm -hmm. All right, he has a, a role to play in judgment too, which we'll get to when we get to the judgment, um, where he is uh, also referred to as our advocate. And again, I couldn't think of a better advocate either. And then now, just a quick glance through some of these uh, chapters in Revelation, just to, to see some of the imagery that appears. We don't have to read all these. We're just going to run through it quickly. Revelation, we're going to start in chapter 1. And just look at four places where we see sanctuary imagery. Sorry, I should have been turning to this because I knew it was coming. Revelation 1, we look at 12 through 20, and this is where Jesus appears before John. And he says, uh, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. So you have the seven golden lampstands. Then he gives a description of how he's, the, the person is dressed, and the description is much like the priest would be in the temple. Of course, the, the, he gets into some other imagery here about the two-edged sword coming out. We know that the priest didn't have two-edged swords coming out of their mouths. <laughs> but uh, he says in here, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So that's a reference to Jesus dying and being resurrected, right? So that's the, the lamb, if you will. And then he gives a description, of course, the seven golden lampstands, um, which you saw were the seven churches. So that seven image churches. is there. If you go to verse or chapter 8, verses 2 through 6, and here, of course, you have the uh, angels stand before God. We're given seven, seven trumpets. And uh, in the sanctuary service, they had priests with trumpets that would announce uh, the different phases. A golden censer. Yep. You have a golden censer, which is, of course, uh, something they used in, this, in the right. temple as well. Altar. You have altar. Yep. Prayers of all the saints, which were the, represented by the incense. You had the golden altar, which is where the sacrifices were. Um, It talks about the smoke of the incense for the prayer of the saints. So we have the altar of incense that is before the throne. All right, so all of those things are in there. And of course, it talks about noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquake, all of those things which are the presence of God, which you had also in the temple. And then chapter 11, verse 19, says the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Now, where was the ark on earth? In the sanctuary. In the sanctuary. <laughs> in the sanctuary, in the most holy place. Most holy place. We talked about that in the sermon last week. And then we go down chapter 15. 
And these are just quick hits. You can read through Revelation. And it's all through the book. Uh, verses 5 through 8, it talks. He says, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues. So it's talking about them coming out. It has the four living creatures. Uh, it says the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple. So there's examples uh, in the Bible where it talks where God filled the temple um, with his presence and smoke, and nobody could go in. It, it, he was so much there, if you will, that nobody could enter the temple. They had to stay out. They couldn't even go in the outer room. They had to stay out, out. So all of that imagery you see comes from uh, the sanctuary that was on earth. So a careful study of these scenes reveals that they are interconnected, showing an internal progression in the salvation accomplished by God. So it also goes as you move through Revelation and through the different scenes uh, from the sanctuary, it progresses from the beginning of the plan all the way to the end of the plan of salvation. And the sanctuary services themselves reflect that. So as we move through the study of the sanctuary, we're going to see how those different phases develop and what they represent. And then, can you look at this I one up? That. Yeah, Nicole's going to look up this one, Hebrews 4.16 for us. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I love that verse. Amen. So with what we've studied so far, how does your study uh, of the sanctuary so far affect your understanding of this verse? Well, the throne of grace, I would guess, would be God's throne that we're going to be going to. Right. So we're like applying ourselves directly to God to get in his mercy. Right. So we, we did a lot of talk about the throne. Right? We talked about the character of God, his the four attributes we talked about were justice, righteousness. What else? Mercy. Mercy. Mm -hmm. And loving kindness, right? Mm -hmm. So those things go hand in hand. So we're talking about here coming before the throne of mercy. We know it's a place of judgment, but we know it's also a place of mercy. Amen. So, and he says we can come boldly. Why can we become boldly? Because we have an advocate on his right society. Because we have our advocate. The person who died for our sins, the person who paid the fine, is standing right next to him, right, in judgment. He's also our lawyer. So that's Amen. why you can come boldly. You don't have to be afraid of the throne. You don't have to be afraid of the judgment. Because you have Christ in your corner. Amen. Right. So we're at the conclusion. So think now, after this study, what does it mean that God dwells in heaven? And how do you understand that concept now that we've gone through all this? What does it mean to you that God dwells in heaven? That it's a real place. It's a real like place. Down on it. You can count it's a on real it. Place I can count on it being there, and then it's never gonna. It's never gonna stop. It's never gonna stop. He's always gonna be there. What mm. can you expect from it? Mercy. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. Tempered with grace. Well, you got mercy, mercy and grace kind of go hand in hand, but mercy, but justice. it's tempered with righteousness and justice, right? So it's all blended together and truthfulness. Right, so God is dependable, he's reliable, you know that you have, uh, you can trust his judgment, and because God dwells in heaven, he's above everything, he's over all else uh, on this earth and every other world throughout, throughout the universe. So those are all very important things to remember. Now next time, uh, we're going to be studying heaven on earth, where we're going mm -hmm. to go through the different earthly sanctuaries throughout history. All right, so there's going to be some things in there that may be a little eye-opening. We're not just looking at the sanctuaries in Israel, but throughout history. 
So there, there's going to be some eye openers there. And that Amen. is next Friday night. Hopefully we'll have a great turnout like we did tonight. Uh, and finally, recommended resource. I'm going to try to have one of these every week. But this book by Joe Cruz goes very well with the study we, we covered tonight, uh, Riches of Grace. You can access this. It's a free download uh, under the free book library at Amazing Facts. You can read it online or you can download it, whichever you prefer. Um, but hopefully you'll check that out if you want just a little bit more on this topic. But that's uh, all I have for tonight. Any closing thoughts before we have a, a closing prayer? Yes, we were just watching actually before we started. I don't know if anybody's seen. Um, it's Days of Noah. Um, it's got Doug Batchelor, Ivor Myers, Walter Veith, a lot of them on it. It's a wonderful documentary, four part series, and it's on Amazon Prime. And for free. It, yeah, yeah, it's for free. And we watched the second one tonight, and it is on the sanctuary and has some beautiful imagery and explains it in ways I've never seen it explained before. So that's the days of Noah. That's a good one. Okay. Definitely. Uh, also, how long is the, I'm sorry, how long is the movie, Kim? Uh, each, so it's, one it's, is, it's, it's, each one is episode. 90 minutes. Okay. And there's, there's four parts, but the second one is on the sanctuary. The first one's on the flood. Um, so we've seen the first two so far. Yeah, and, and the first one was actually really cool because they got into all the science of proving the flood. Yeah. Oh. Like geologists and all that stuff, too. So, like, that was actually really interesting. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good recommendation. Appreciate it. Thank you Thank for sharing you. it. Yeah. All right, then. Well, I believe we'll uh, go ahead and close this out. We've gone just a little over an hour. And we're trying to keep these to an hour. Uh, and remember, next week, same time, if you want uh, me to email you this, um, this study, because I know some of you were talking at the beginning about whether you should take notes. Yeah, please, I would like to receive it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send it out afterwards. Uh, if you don't get it within a day, because uh, I'm going to try to just send it to the people who are here, I might miss somebody. So if you, if you don't get it, just send me an email and I'll, I'll send it to you. That's not okay, a because I have the different, the, a different email. So um, it probably, um, I'm oh, going well, to... Yeah, yeah. Then definitely send me an email, so I'll send it to the right I'm going to, Okay, I don't, I'm going to send it to Nicole, so she can... She can uh, okay. I, don't have your, I don't have your phone, your... your um, oh, I have your email. I'm it, going to mail to you, okay. Okay. All right, very good. Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads and we'll have a closing prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the guidance and instruction you provided us in your word. We thank you for the reassurance that we can know that we have not only a Heavenly Father who loves us and watches over us and who has all things in his control, but we have an advocate in the Son who lived and died as one of us and now represents us in your holy throne room. Lord, Amen. We, we ask that you will fill us with your grace and your spirit and help us to represent you properly to the world that we may live out the character that you wish us to live so we can draw others to you. We thank you for we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, Amen. thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.